So our guest today was the first woman to take a role as a director sportif in the men's world tour. She held that position for three years and is now moving on to another role at a different team, but this time in the women's peloton. She had a great career herself. She was a team manager. She was a team owner and now director and head of sports. Yenzi, Sherry Pridham was our guest. What did you think of that chat we had with her? It was fantastic. I liked her easy approach to things, to, you know, stay positive, keep smiling. Like, every now and then she had, like, a little giggle about some old memories. It was a really, really good chat. And she really, she lives and breathes cycling. I mean, she started, what did she say, at the age of 11-ish? All her, all her life she was involved in some function with cycling. She basically, cycling is her life, and it shows true every word she says. Yeah, uh, I can't imagine the ceilings that she had to break down to get to where she is today. And she's so mellow and calm about it, but she's done some amazing things and changed the sport forever. So sit back and relax and enjoy our interview with Sherry Pridham. Welcome, Sherry Pridham, to Bobby and Jens. Good to see you both. Well, you know, it's been a while, Sherry. We we had you back on the old Fizzo days, and that was when, right when you were about to start in the, the men's peloton with ISN. I mean, a lot has happened since 2020 when we spoke last time. But um, I have to ask, it seems like you got a little broken wing there. Um, do you want to tell us about what happened? It was a it was a while ago since we last spoke, yeah. Um, and it just seems a hundred years ago, more, rather than uh, three, four, year, five years ago, whatever it was. But yeah, no, I've just had um, actually my third surgery on left, and both both my shoulders are constant issues with dislocations and so on. Just an old crash injury from when I was an ex bike rider, and uh, it's sort of uh, stayed with me for the rest of my life. So I've got to be really careful with what I do. I think sticky bottles not really helping the situation very much, but hey-ho. And, uh, you know, is so this was a elective surgery that you had done in the off-season of a past injury then? It wasn't something that you did on the bike over the last weekend? No, uh, it was actually an injury that I, um, I, I re-injured it in the Tour of Switzerland this year. Um, on a long, long descent, did a sticky bottle, which which is fine. Um, and it sort of, well, it wasn't really a straight arm, but yeah, the, the guy on the end of it was, was 80 kilos plus, and uh, yeah, it was a bit bit heavier than I anticipated. But the, the, sl the, the sling was easy. It was the pain at night that uh, I realized I'd done something. But I carried on working, carried on uh, doing races and the pain got worse and worse and in the end I thought I better get this checked out and it turned out to be um three tears within the rotor cuff um so I I did it good and proper as they say and how's the recovery going when are you uh, back in action and um fully mobile and ready to go again back in action this week uh, so I took, oh uh, yeah 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 I took a week off and then I got withdrawal symptoms of sitting in the office and uh, not having any work to do. But no, in in uh, in all reality, I think it's probably about four more weeks in the sling and then uh, maybe we can see how it is with, with the strength in January, but maybe I won't be driving just yet. I am in January. We'll have to see. Well, Sherry... You know, I went back and I listened to our, our podcast that we did back in, in 2020, and um, I realized that we didn't really talk so much about how you got into cycling in, in the first place. Can you, for, for our new Bobby and Jens listeners and viewers, can you give us a little update on how this started for you? I mean, we know that you're in the car now, but you were a racer for over 15 years yourself. Yeah, I started when I was really young. Um, I was I was a little bit of a tomboy, and uh, I was racing bikes around the streets and racing the boys. And then uh, next door neighbor said, "Do you fancy riding a race?" And it's uh, you, you might have heard of it. It's the August Cycle Tour uh, in Cape Town, South Africa, and uh, it was my home race. And in fact, my training partner 
uh, and very close friend. Yeah, uh, you might have heard of him, Douglas Ryder. Um, we grew up together, and uh, <laughs> of course. And yeah, we we were training partners, and and uh, yeah, we we still stay in close contact now. But uh, yeah, we race bikes together. And I started as an as an eleven year old. So I actually have a photo of Douglas and I when we were eleven. And we, ironically, we both won Clonaga bikes. We both had uh, matching gloves, matching kit, matching helmets, and that was our first race in the August Cycle Tour as eleven year old. Kept on riding and racing after that. And um, how and when did you transfer over to Europe? Because you raced. Um, a lot on the European circuit after that for many, many years, right? How did yeah, that I go? Did. Yeah, I did. Um, so I was born in the UK. My father was uh, uh, in the Navy and obviously was transferred to Cape Town. And of course, I had to go along. So as soon as I was old enough, 18th birthday, I packed the bags and went to uh, to the family back in the UK. And I've not gone back since. So I'm still here. So technically, I still have the, the lingo, the bit of the, the South African. Uh, when I get angry, I think I, I speak a little bit more with South African accent. But um, no, I've been in the UK ever since. But racing bikes, uh, I think I retired when I was about 33, 34 um, of injuries more than, uh, you know, more than uh, the brain wanting to stop. But we know that women's cycling is making some huge steps forward. But can you tell us about what women's cycling in the UK when you were 19 years old was like? I, I imagine it's not quite the, the juggernaut organization that it is now. It was pretty much non-existent. Um, the, the racing here was maybe if, if you were lucky, you would get 40, 50 maximum. But most of the local races, if there were three women racing in in the peloton with the men, uh, you you were lucky, you know. Uh, but it's incredible, absolutely incredible, how the women's scene has grown from uh, from strength to strength, you know. But I, I would never give up my time in, in the peloton now, you know. I had great moments with uh, with Inna. I'm sure Jens, you know Inna. And in a Tutenberg, and there's many, many German girls that we were on the circuit with that uh, we took care of each other, and uh, and we had an unforgettable time in the Gruppettos uh, once the small climbers disappeared up the up the big climbs, you know. Um, but I, I would never, I would never, never give up my time as a as a bike rider in in those days, you know. I um, I did actually discuss. Uh, With my partner last uh, a couple of nights ago, that you know what what would have what would it have been like, you know, if we had the support nowadays uh, that the girls have got and the women have got nowadays, you know. But we had our time, you know. It was good times. We washed our own kit. We 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 stood in the shower, washed our own kit, rolled the kit up in the towel, rang the rang the kit out, got the team kit dry, made our own water bottles. Uh, If you were lucky to have a swan ear in, in a 150k race, but you know, you save the little bit of water in your, in the top of the, the lid that, you know, that you could just about get the last drip of water because you knew you wouldn't get another bit on. Um, but those are the good old days, you know, and I think they made us certainly the women that are involved now in my generation from racing are uh, involved in cycling, I think made made us who we are today you know definitely was some great times but also um, tough times sometimes i believe um, in, in terms of um, like earning a living there was next to no money in women cycling back then no. right how no do you survive money. how do you pay rent food or for the car or travels how do you manage to, to keep afloat friends family mostly um we had something here in the uk that uh we used to call the doll run. Um, so you have to have to sign on every week to get your small paycheck. And that's basically how I survived. Um, and then when I was sort of able to, to spread my wings and enter to Europe, maybe, uh, I might've got a hundred euros every other month, uh, to help towards a flight or, or whatever. But you know, those times when you, You reached out to team managers to try to get a ride on a team. 
you'd pay for your ticket because you got no we didn't have internet in those days like we do now so you would you would go to a travel agent and you would book your flight and then maybe spend two days of sleeping on your bike bag in in the hope that your team manager would pick remember to pick you up you know to take you to your race and then somehow arrive back home you know no insurance nothing but you just you flew by the seat of your pants really and there I don't know how I, I yeah just again another one of those character characteristic moments where it just makes you who you are today you know so after that amazingly posh lifestyle that you were leading um living off 100 euros every every month you you end your career um due to an injury i i i if i remember correctly and then you start in the management of a cycling team in the uk in what the mid 2000s is that about right no 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 not even not even it was uh, uh so the, the actual accident i had was a, it was a hit and run accident um so never found the driver uh, so significant injuries on both collarbone shoulders neck hip wrist um and i still believed i still believed at the time that you know like we all do as bike riders you know we can get over this and we'll come back fighting and fighting stronger and be a better bike rider but i think at the time i can't remember it was 2004 i think probably when uh when it happened and then i tried to hang my career out until around about 2006 2007 uh secured a nice little sponsorship from um american uh, based company um and everything was looking great and then on that, i got i got ill and in a nutshell uh that particular sponsor said look uh yeah why don't we put this into a men's uh, well, on a junior boys team take the sponsorship money we'll support you here's five thousand pounds go and set the team up so we set up the uh the merlin development squad and uh I went round Eurobike and went hunting for sponsors with my uh, five kilogram portfolio looking for sponsors. And that's where I first met you, Jens. Yeah, I was probably a lot younger and fitter and skinnier back then. <laughs> oh, I don't I even don't... want to talk about it. Don't even get me started about the good old days. And uh, you were successful with that sponsor. They are what well, we were, we, yeah, but I can remember you did a criterium. I don't know if you can, rem you know, but there was this criterium and we were, well, I wasn't drinking in those days in terms of, you know, the odd, the odd glass of wine. I was still learning to have a glass of wine then, you know, being a, a professional or just coming off the edge of a professional. But no, that was where I, uh, I witnessed, you know, how you guys enjoyed the, the, the criteriums and the sort of post-season crits and, That was nice to see. Yeah, I believe it was in Ravensburg, I think. That's the one. And That's um, the one. Yep, yep. And uh, the top three got like a little a model tower of the city, of the city entrance gates as a trophy. I remember that. I still have it somewhere in the house, that little trophy. Yeah, yeah no. I remember that. But um, yeah. you were successful with your sponsorship hunting because you had that team for a while and it was going going good, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Merlin Development Squad we had for three years and then we stepped that up to under 23. So we took those juniors through to under 23 level. And then it wasn't long before the the team was evolving. More sponsors were, you know, there was the good times when sponsors were, you know, willing to be involved with cycling. And uh, yeah, we, we grew the team and then I was approached uh, by... Um, Uh, another team here in the UK to to manage that. So I became the first female sports director in the UK, but also in Europe at the time. Um, and I can remember my first race. It was uh, New Yorker Challenge uh, as a as a sports director, and we drew car one. And uh, that is so cool. Yeah, and I uh, obviously I you know, and at the time. I, I sort of shotgunned my partner Eddie. He was uh, the team manager for the junior road uh, GB junior team at the time. So I sort of learned team manager DS role from him um, by going with him on junior trips and so on. So he said, "I'm not letting you drive just yet." He says, "I'll I'll I'll 
do the first stage with you and then he says I'll let you loose and he let me loose and I think the first descent I drove on was descending Sacralobra or something I can't I can't remember what but whatever it was and we got we got back to the finish and he goes yep off you go you can drive a car so it kind of went from there um but that was my first sort of uh intro into um driving the team car 2009 and then in 2010 back end of 2010 we were approached by by rally bikes here in the uk and uh they asked me to, to to run the team, and that was the team I consequently went on to to, to own. And uh, we, I owned the team for eight years, and then uh, due to COVID, of course, I think you know the story. Uh, we wrapped everything up at the end of 2020, um, and then my journey began with the story of uh, having a full bottle of wine and so tired of chasing sponsors and saving the team and thinking I can survive and paying everybody and that was it that night I came home I said to Eddie that's it we're stopping and he goes no give it another month it was about this time uh, back then and no I said that's it we're stopping the team drank another bottle of wine and uh, thought well what have I got to lose and that's when I emailed uh, a handful of Ah, men's will tour teams I said yeah why not what what can I lose you know and at that time the, the you know the women's scene was not as it is now but I never gave it any kind of consideration back then to you know to 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 go to the women's scene you know it wasn't it wasn't as attractive and my dream my dream is still to be a sports director at, at the Tour de France you know uh, but yeah, I've had a cr- I've crossed over to the other side now, so uh, yeah, it's uh, a big change, big change. Okay, so explain to me a little bit of the timing. Um, your team in 2020, you decide that that's it. I'm not going to continue this this rat race, chasing sponsors, stressing out all the time. But then you became the first world tour female director sportif. Uh, that next year for Israel Startup Nation. How did yeah. that conversation take place? How did that negotiation work? Well, to be honest, I sent the emails. I sent five emails and I got a response uh, from Israel within the hour of writing the email. Um, And I can remember thinking that it was going to be the typical Dear Sherry uh, thank you for your interest. No thanks. Goodbye. And I could I couldn't physically read the email, so I passed it over to Eddie. So I said, "Can you can you just read what it says because I can't handle this. Just what does it say?" I thought it was going to be rejection. And he says, uh, "Well, they want to talk to you." And I just started crying like a baby. I just the the, the excitement. I took the email. I was it was like. I was a demented woman, I don't know, screaming, shouting. Yes, it was just elation. And then I sort of calmed down, and then I can remember getting the phone call from uh, Chell Kolstrom. Um, and uh, he said, yeah, we'd like to talk to you. And he took the time to call me from the final stage in Paris at Tour de France. And I knew then if he'd got the time to call me from such a big race that that was the team I I wanted to ultimately start with I am um, and I still uh I still have so many fond memories from from that and so I've met Chell again in in Canada recently and yeah some good times there really good times so um how was it for you the first time um walking into that uh, big first training camp normally end of the year December the new team members get introduced to to the team. How was that? And to ease you up a little bit, I remember my entrance because for the first half of a day, they thought I would be one of the new mechanics. You know, I walked funny. I had long hair. I had like a, a mullet. I did wear glasses back then before I had the surgery on my eyes. So nobody took me as a cyclist. They all thought I would be one of the new mechanics or the bus driver. So how was it for you walking into this uh, new team um, as a woman and like, did everybody knew you're going to be a DS or they thought you'd be on another position in the team? 
No, I think by then everybody knew it was December camp. Everybody knew that uh, I was a DS. Um, but because of Brexit, it was the first time, and also because of uh, you know the end or the start of COVID. Uh, well, no, the end of COVID it was. Uh, I arrived late because the customs took me aside and interrogated me for almost four hours. So I kept half the team waiting on the team bus. Um, hours and hours and it was just I, I felt so bad but anyway I made it to the I made it to the hotel and I was just I was pretty relaxed but the first guy to meet me was Andre Greifel and Andre was sat in the in the reception and he gave me such a warm welcome and uh the respect and uh it, it was immediate you know I, I will never forget that moment and also, likewise with Mike Woods, um, he actually made a point of coming over to me and introducing himself. Uh, so, it, it, you know, I felt at home straight away, but of course I was still in, oh my God, there's a big bus, there's about 30 cars, there's 70 staff members, there's, you know, so everything was on the big grand scale. But I think in my mind, I was ready for that big step, you know, and uh, I just, you just have to grow some balls, really, and just be, you know, put on that face that I've had to put on and be brave and bold and whatever it takes, I'm going to do this, you know? And stepping into a very male-dominated sport rooted in culture and tradition, um, what were the main challenges for you going into a men's world tour team or I mean, you said it was pretty, pretty easy transition, but I mean, that had to have been tough. It's always tough for the, for somebody to do something groundbreaking for the first time. Still to this day, to the last race I did with, uh, with Lotto Destiny, it was still, um, in my mind, but probably from the outside in, but in my mind, I still had to prove myself every single day or try harder. I felt like I had to, uh, give more to be my absolute best and I I think it was it was my own self-criticism I think that I looked at myself in a mirror and thought you know maybe I'm not good enough for this because like, times and times I would question my own ability but actually I didn't do that bad you know I I, I was so critical of myself and expected so much more because I, I I think when you are in a man's world you do have to continuously give more uh to be able to fit and and in the hardest environment without without being disrespectful the hardest environment i think for a woman to be involved in is is the is a classic belgium uh traditional old school team you know steeped in history and uh it was the biggest hardest and uh probably the last Two and a half years, the best best learning school I could ever have wished for. So what part of the sport or your job was easier than you thought? And what part did you struggle the most with? The, the preparing the races, the speech in the bus, driving the cars, doing the layout. Okay, we got to have on mountain one, once one year with 20 bottles. On the next mountain, we need 30 bottles. What what a, what was or were the parts they were easier and which was the hardest part for you getting into this world? I think uh, I mean in the in the, the initial the first year you know you're still learning the ropes you're still learning the the transition the the way the presentations have to be done in the bus you know learning uh, or, or or adapting to knowing the riders and the the you know whether the riders are a climber a sprinter you know the tactics getting to know the tactics of the other teams but the more racing you do the more you just sort of slide into that momentum but for me i think probably the hardest is when you have um higher sort of you know top quality riders leaders that you have to almost almost impress with your skill because i think for me, it always felt like I was being tested in certain scenarios. So maybe getting, you know, getting a lead out 100% right or, or you know, 
hours I used to spend going over, you know, the last 5K or the 3K to 2K to 700 meters to, to 300, but whatever it was, you know, I think the higher the level the rider, so like maybe like a Caleb Ewan or uh, working alongside now lately with the um, uh, last year with Arno de Lee, um, it, it, it is a big difference with, with a, a rider like, say, Andre Greipel or Caleb to a young sprinter that's just coming onto the scene and and spending time with Arno de Lee on the races that I did with him this year, I saw him change, you know, from like a boy to a man. And by the time I finished with him, my last race uh, with him was in uh, Quebec, which he won. And that ironically was my last race with Lotto. So I started the year with, with Arno de Lee winning his first race in Europe in in. Uh, in uh, Valencia, and then and then uh, winning with him again in in Quebec in Canada. So it's just seeing the transition, you know, from from boy to to man. But yeah, the hard the hardest thing definitely is uh, gaining the respect of the big leaders. Okay, so three years in the World Tour Men's Peloton, and we're gonna get to your your next venture here in a little bit. But you know, due to Instagram and the cameras that are inside the cars these days, we've seen many clips of, you know, the reaction when sure. something, you know, everything works out and a rider win, wins a race. For you doing this for your first time, what are those memories, your best memories from those three years in the men's world tour Peloton? I think the first one for me was uh, having our win in, uh, um, I think it was Torino. We won a stage um, from a breakaway uh, with Mads Wood Schmidt. Um, ironically, second place to uh, Brent van Moor Lotto. Um, but having that that first win, it was almost idyllic, and I couldn't have asked for a better script. You know, I mean, I had so much support from first DS in the in uh, Nicky Sorensen in the car. Uh, so it was a complete team effort, but to actually have my first Will Tour win uh, in my first season so soon was um, something I couldn't have I could I couldn't have written a better start to the to this chapter, you know. Um, but I have so many memories now; it's just it's it's incredible, incredible. Would you be willing to share like a terrible memory as well, where you go, oh my god, that went so bad, or you go, nah, forget about it, just talk about the good times. <laughs> yeah, I got I got one. We were doing a descent. Hang on, I can't remember the race now. Uh, but I was I was called up. I think it might have been Catalonia or or something in Spain. And I was called up, and uh, I was having to pass the Astana car, and uh, Vinokurov was sitting in the in the driver's seat, <laughs> and they put they they sort of moved and i sort of moved to overtake and i clipped his wing mirror and i think that was probably like oh my god vino sat in the car and, but i did there was no damage to the car or anything <laughs> like that but i was like oh shit dead you know but just a little <laughs> bit like that so i had to go up to him you know when we got back to the peloton and i just like well, sorry you know but no i yeah sometimes yeah when when the race doesn't go to plan and you know, you've got to have the debriefs. I think the debriefs are probably um, where you really have to know, you know, how to deal with with riders if it doesn't go to their expectations. Because of course, it's not, it's 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 almost never the rider's fault, you know. So you you have to you know how to manage the the, the different characters and uh, and analyze. You know, let everybody speak fairly, and you know what's said on the bus is done and when you get off the bus you go to your evening meal and then we get on with the job the next day you know that's always something i've kept with me uh every race i've gone to debrief what goes on the bus stays on the bus and carry on with a smile the next day yeah <laughs> athletes man they are uh sometimes a, a very uh particular uh, group of young men, but, um, so you three years in the men's world tour Peloton, and this is the most exciting thing. And the real reason why I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today, after three years, now you've taken a role as, um, let me get this right. 
the head of sports for Team yeah. UAE ADQ. So Correct. tell us a little bit about this new role and what the head of sports looks like. <laughs> Um, it's it's uh, I suppose it's more um, I'm in charge of the performance uh, so the performance group sports directors uh, race programs staff programs um, it, it's a slow progression to to learning the ropes of of managing and maybe one day who knows general managing a, a big team but um, the the role was sort of uh, I guess given to me or, or offered to me almost three years ago now I'd been in contact with um, Melissa Moncondo who's the head of the team and uh, Melissa was always keeping me informed of you know the progression and her dreams of where she wants to take UAE team ADQ uh, and then I got into uh, I got uh, contacted by our now new CEO um, uh, Camilla Garcia and uh, we just kept in contact over the last two years. And then um, they proposed uh, me an offer to come and do head of sports. Um, really just lead the sports directors, um, bring in some infrastructure, um, just some systems, some protocols, uh, professionalize things a little bit for, for them. Uh, and see where we can take the team. They've got big aspirations, you know, to build the team. We we've got to build the team to be uh, the best women's team in the world, you know. So um, that is, uh, they want it quick, and uh, yeah, we hope we hope we can do that with the infrastructure and uh, step by step. I think is for me is the is the key. So do you already have like roughly an idea or a timetable? Like how common uh wind tunnel testing in women's cycling? Okay. Because it's also a question of budget, right? There's no question that people benefit from it, but it's a question of budget. Would you bring in nutritionist? Because uh, nutrition has uh, changed a lot in men's cycling as well. They take a lot more oh, yeah. carbohydrates in now during the racing. So are you... Trading some of your old knowledge into the new job, or what is your your plan? H how you want to make the team better, faster? No, I think you know. I think I've listened. I've listened now to to all the performance coaches, to the sports directors, nutritionists, doctors, physios, osteos, everybody, the mechanics, operations. I've listened to everybody over the last month or so. Um, one thing I didn't want to do was come in and change the operation. I think you have to listen to people uh, and see how you can implement changes slowly for the better of of the team. So it's it, it's a slow process, and of course for me, uh, there's no secret that I I've got a very steep learning curve now in terms of uh, learning the woman's peloton. Um, but that's no different to coming into the men's world tour, you know, and, and and learning that, I I think I did that pretty quick. Um, but it's it, wind tunnel testing is it, you know they they were doing that before I arrived. Nutritionists fully involved with the hotels uh, before the team's arrival, so the menus are checked, the menus are prepared for for nutrition. Uh, altitude training camps, uh, it's all in full swing. So it's just a case of you know working very closely with the performance directors. Uh, and making sure that the girls have, have got everything they need. So there's actually, in terms of comparison to what I've seen with the, the men's world tour and, and now with uh, UA Team ADQ, Cube, there's no comparison uh, difference at all. The support is there 100% for the, for the woman. So with all these things that you've learned from the men's world tour and now the women's world tour, um, Jens and I, when we were on a team together, uh, Bjarne Reese was very, um, strict about developing a certain culture. You know, you can have all the wind tunnel tests, the altitude camps, but that, that those core values of the team and, um, Jens, you remember these as much as I do, you know, teamwork was made up by communication, respect, loyalty, and commitment. What sort of culture 
do you want to bring to this team with your vast amount of experience and grit throughout your whole career? I think for me, it's important that everyone, uh, most importantly, um, the staff are listened to. Um, they all have a voice, they all have opinions, but I think it, it, respect is the first thing that uh, that's important to me. But to make sure that everybody feels part of something that um, that everything they bring or the smallest thing they might bring, it doesn't matter, you know, that we can have, everybody has a value. And uh, for, for me, it's it's been is that quality of is listening to to what people want and empowering the girls and giving them belief and um giving them the excite excitement the motivation that you know the drive to be able to believe in each other's um skills and and mindsets and well-being and whatever that might be you know it's just um i'm pretty laid back and i'm not i don't think i'll ever change that in you know, in the roles that I I might take on from now on upwards, but um, it's just being understood as a person, and I think that's that's certainly comes from the top, and that's probably one one of the reasons why I made the change is because um, Melissa Monconda and certainly um, um, Camilla Gothia they listened to what I wanted, listened to what I wanted to bring on board to the team, and I think they had confidence in me, so. That, as you say, um, it it comes from the top, stems from the top, and that's something I'm uh, I'm determined to continue on behalf of uh, on behalf of our management. You know, just just be happy, but really tight ship, um, honest, respectful, and uh, yeah, let's do it. You know, uh, roll the sleeves up and get stuck in. So now at uh, this year, we have um, seen a little bit a change of generation with the old queen, Annemiek van Floyten, you know, retiring and not being able anymore to beat the young new queen of cycling, Demi Vollering, at the tour. Are you involved in scouting the next generation, the 16, 17, 15 year old girls you race right now? And do you have time to go visit these races or you watch them on an online stream? How do you find? The next new team you following. So we have four um, coaches that are responsible for for reporting back to our performance director, and then we'll have a meeting once a week. So we certainly are looking, are scouting, and you, it, it's absolutely incredible that you know we're we're already looking for the next juniors. So you know for the for the juniors, the young girls that are watching this, um, you know you have dreams, you have ambitions. Um, the World Tour teams are, are watching, you know, um, already agents already asking, you know, we've seen this young girl, 16, 17 years old, you know, keep an eye on her, Here's a, here is a power file, you know. And I mean, I, I can remember when I was 15, 16, we didn't have power files back in those days, but, you know, you would never dream of having an agent um, and, and certainly my mindset when I had the Conti team in the UK was, I wouldn't deal directly with an agent because I didn't feel that was appropriate at the time. But now you cannot, you you cannot not have that relationship with agents now because you're going to miss the big champions coming through. You know those potential future stars. Um, what do you think would be the biggest change or challenge for you coming from, you know, a ten, fifteen million dollar budget? to a woman's team with probably a lot smaller budget, less people working there, different races. What do you think would be the biggest challenge for you or the biggest change? I think um, I think that the job role itself, you know, it's um, the, the, I'm now responsible not only just to do my daily day-to-day -day DS work, I'm responsible now for um, cohesive working group of staff, making sure that, you know, They have a race program to follow, the riders, the Devo team. Uh, it, it, it's just that there's a lot more complex activities with, with meetings, uh, sponsors meetings, uh, being responsible and answerable to um, the new CEO, Camilo Garcia. Um, so just a, it's, it's, it's adapting to the, 
to the workload, I guess, not just preparing for race to race presentations, day plans and uh, and general plans, you know, so it's a it's a whole big scope of uh, and a big adjustment for sure. Um, and then, of course, as I keep saying, it's it's really getting to know the woman's peloton PDQ, you know, super PDQ. So one thing that is always interesting, uh, taking on a new venture like this is people's, um, I guess, hesitation to change. And I've always thought and heard, I don't know where I heard this, but I always kind of kept it in my, my notebook that a goal without a plan is just a wish, but a plan with a goal is a vision or a roadmap. How do you get so many young women and staff members maybe that have been with the team for a while or like yourself that is new to kind of come together and understand that vision and that roadmap that you're trying to um, roll out for them? Oh, again, that come, it's very simple. It comes from the top. You know, the direction is, is clear and precise. Um, so uh, nobody has a misunderstanding of what the direction of where we want to take this team. Um, so that was made very clear in, in our mission and uh, the focus is, is very clear. Um, that will be spelled out to the riders, more intricate, more personal uh, meetings with staff and, and riders in the coming weeks, coming months, it, December camp, January camp. Um, but of course, all of that is fine tuned. Um, and I think I keep saying belief, you know, they've got to believe what you're saying. Um, you've got to be able to, uh, you know, have that confidence and that trust and give them that, that, that ceiling that they, they know what, you know, okay, Sherry knows what she's doing. That's fine. You know, and I, I think speaking with the girls now, uh, on one-to-ones, I've, uh, I wasn't quite sure how, how that would be sort of working with the men. Um, but I really enjoyed the emotional, um, difference sort of sitting down and doing a one-to-one -one with, uh, with a woman compared to, you know, maybe a Thomas de Ghent or, or, or somebody like that, the, the emotional approach is completely different, um, and calmer to, to a degree. So it's just adapting a little bit to, to my mindset you know that I don't have to be um not someone that I'm not but I can also be myself you know a, a little bit more I can be the woman I I, I I dream to be you know I just want to be myself um it it sounds then like you have a higher position like a bigger role but you will be less involved in the daily business so maybe not sitting in a car anymore Are you okay with that? Are you aware that you might not have that much personal contact anymore on a daily basis no, no. with all the riders as a DS? No, it's actually far from. So um, that was one of the reasons why we we came up with a head of sport is because I didn't want to lose that uh, that contact with the team car uh, that um, you know that experience that I could bring within the team car to the girls. Um, so it was really a, something that I insisted on staying involved and I've got as mu as many race days as I probably have now or, or m maybe not as many as, as I did this year, but, but certainly I will be very much hands-on. So I've got my work cut out, both office skills and, uh, and, and meetings, but I'm going to be very much hands-on in that team car. That's great to hear. Yeah. I mean, that, that's where it all kind of happens, right? That's uh, command command central but women's cycling obviously <laughs> has grown in leaps and bounds especially since back when when you were racing um but what would you what do you think improvements that we can make i mean hey we're talking about women's team in general not only women's teams but now development women's teams like this this is a big deal i guess what change would you like to see to make women's cycling even better or at least sustain the growth curve of what it's currently on? Um, it's probably a little bit of a gray area in terms of my beliefs, but 
you know, I, I believe that equality is top of the list. I am, you know, I, it's to a point, but I also am quite aware that the woman's peloton still needs to develop and it's probably developing a lot faster than anybody's ever anticipated. So I think we need to be mindful of that. But I do believe that if you're training and racing and working as hard as your male colleagues, equally so if you're a female swanier, DS, mechanic, whatever, that that you should be treated equally and with the same respect and and um, re- remuneration, so to speak. But I think for me, it's a it's a time scale thing, you know, and and maybe that's where I differ to some of my my woman colleagues now that you should be given everything. It's it's almost a case that we have to work. You know, we have to work at this to earn it. But if you're good enough, and I'll say that to to whether you're a male or a female, man, woman, whatever, if you're good enough, you'll get rewards for being good, not because you're a man or not because you're a woman. So if we have a young cycling girl, woman, listen to this, what would you tell that young female cyclist What would be your message? Like, hey, train harder, train more, believe in yourself, or what would you say? Please never forget to to not lose that enjoyment because if you are 14, 15, 16, and now we're sending the messages out from every Will Tour team that Will Tour teams are, are looking at, at you as a 13, 14, 15-year-old And so, you know, the equipment is getting more expensive. So parents are under pressure, you know, to, to you know, to give their children the, the best equi- equipment possible. For me, it's never lose sight of why you're doing the sport. And if you want to do cyclocross, if you want to do mountain biking at that age, just Feel free, you know, Zoe Baxter is a typical cl- a classic example of that. You know, you watch Zoe, she has so much fun and enjoyment while she's riding any any sort of, whether it's gravel, cyclocross. Um, so never lose sight of why you're doing it, but always remember to have some fun while you're doing it. That's That's great advice. Great advice. You know, it boils down to passion. Passion allows you to have a goal. A goal gives you purpose. That purpose gives you motivation. That motivation gives you focus. But having fun and executing, I think, are are two of the the biggest things that 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 young riders need to to learn. But um, Sherry, listen, it has been great catching up with you again. So excited to see how your role of head of sports develops in at your new team. And thank you just so much again for blessing us with your presence today on Bobby and Jens. No, thank you so much for having me. I, it's been a pleasure. Well, that's all our time for this week. Huge thanks to Sherry for being our guest. Thanks for listening. Please give us a five-star review and share us with your friends. The show was a value production in association with Shock Giraffe. This episode was produced and edited by Mark Payne. Remember to check out the video version of this podcast by heading to the Outside Watch YouTube channel. Cherry's off to new role, but we want to know what your best and worst experiences of starting a new job were. Maybe you parked in your boss's parking space, or maybe you discovered you were being paid more than you expected. Please get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, Threads, and Facebook. Just head to at Bobby and Jens and give us a follow.